So how's everyone doing today? Yeah? A little quiet this morning. Was uh, everybody partying late last night? <laughs> so um, while I was here yesterday, my husband took my three-year-old and four-year-old to Knott's Berry Farm for the day. And I got home. They, they managed to keep themselves up late enough for me to give them a hug. And then they both literally just fell fast asleep. We're talking about two children that now stay up later than my husband and I do. <laughs> um, so I think they actually managed to party harder than um, a Drupal camp yesterday. <laughs> so um, if you weren't at the, who, how many of you were at Easily Accessible yesterday? Okay, so, so some of you, some of you weren't. Um, if you weren't there, my name is Rain Michaels. I've been part of the LA Drupal community now for, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 10 or 11 years. Um, it's been incredibly uh, valuable for me over the years, and so it's, um, it's great to continue to be able to come back and talk. Um, we're, this talk is about component-based design, uh, which um, how many of you are familiar with or using component-based design in your work right now? Okay, so, so some of you. Who attended Mario's sessions yesterday? Okay, a, a couple of you. Um, so I am going to be talking about component-based design more from a conceptual standpoint, why it's useful. I'm not sure what compelled me to label this as an intermediate talk because it should be fine for beginners as well. It's really more on a sort of theoretical level, what is component-based design, why is it valuable, and more from the perspective of a user experience designer, um, especially somebody thinking about accessibility. Uh, so that's what we're covering today. Uh, and my original title for this was Stronger Together, which then got changed to Strengthen User Bonds Through Component-Based Design. And the idea behind that being that really uh, the, the goal here is to think about the products that we're putting out as something cohesive, something that exists where, where all of the pieces within that product exist together. Uh, how many people in this room consider yourself either front-end or back-end developers? So most people in this room, which means that you are probably already familiar with the value and concept of components from the standpoint of code. And over the years, as we've become more and more, as developers, we've become more and more used to working with uh, code in a more dry format, code that can be reused in, in snippets where we're actually being able to kind of create little pieces and then use those consistently throughout our applications. Uh, we've seen how that's made it easier to develop. It's made it easier to iterate and to keep our, our applications up to date. Drupal itself with its module system is the same kind of a, a concept. Uh, so the idea behind component-based design is how do we bring that concept into the design world because design is where these things and and here we're talking about interaction and visual design i don't like to just say visual design because design is so much more than that it's about audio interaction it's about touch it's about understanding um, but how do we bring what we've benefited from as developers as we've started to look more and more at systems of code into this design world as well. So we're going to look at what component-based and atomic design actually are. What is a design system? You, these, these all mean slightly different things, but you'll hear them interchangeably. And today, we're actually going to use them interchangeably because for the purpose of this talk, they aren't really that different. Um, and we're going to look at why this approach not only uh, works well for user experience and accessibility, but it also works well for creating better documentation uh, for developers, creating better communication, and uh, enabling faster and ideally less expensive development and prototyping. Uh, we'll also look at the things that you need to be thinking about when you're looking at a design system. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about maintenance of that. I don't actually have a huge number of slides because hopefully at a certain point we get through the slides and then this becomes more of a conversation. So what is, com oh, 
And with that being said, if at any point in, the, in this talk you have a question, you're unsure of language that I'm using, uh, or you want to contradict something that I say because of your experiences, please just raise your hand and we'll have that conversation because I think that's going to be more valuable than just me talking for um, an hour. So what is component-based design? Uh, this right here is an, a screenshot of the components of the base material design sticker sheet. Who's familiar with material design? A few of you. I like seeing those hands go up. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the links are actually in here in the slide deck, which I will make sure are linked from the session node following this session. A material design is an open source design system that's put out by Google, the Google Material Design System, and you can find it at material.io. And it's an amazing starting point because a huge amount of work has gone into considering this design system and ensuring that there's a lot of accessibility uh, considerations within it, that the patterns are consistent. And it's been tested extensively across different device types, different operating systems. Um, so what you're seeing here, if you're thinking in terms of Drupal as Drupal developers, you're kind of seeing the different views or the different entities and how they might actually present themselves or different fields and how they might present themselves forward. But you're not seeing them in the context of a completed comp. And instead, you're seeing each of those little bits and pieces broken up into kind of what the, the reason for the word atom or atomic design into their atomic chunks, those little itsy bits and pieces like how you would have a database. One of the great things about Drupal as a content management system is that you can really take your, your content and break it out into little tiny chunks of data, each one in their own individual database um, field, so, or their, their own cell. Uh, so this gives you that opportunity to do that in the design context as well, which makes things far more reusable and enables you to actually create a more cohesive and consistent design, to, uh, design for your products, uh, which is, is fun when you think about it because we're so used to just seeing comps come to us as developers. And the truth of the, of the matter is that those comps that those designers come up with are often so far from what we're really building that they just sort of become some kind of a, a reference point or, or a myth that we're supposed to adhere to and yet it doesn't actually work. If you don't know what I'm talking about, raise your hand because I want to be jealous of you. <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of defining what a design system is or does, um, it really takes all of those visual, and I, I did specify visual here, but uh, designs a really comprehensive design system that might be for a product that also includes other types of interactions. Um, all of those sort of interaction points and it defines them based on the, the actual elements themselves so that you're creating patterns uh, that your application can use across any iteration of it. Uh, so you're thinking about your links, your buttons, all of those interaction points. You're thinking about your forms, your error states, your confirmation states. You're thinking about your lists. You're thinking about your menus, your, uh, your page layout by content type, your paragraph layouts, your, your display types, your field sets, your modals. How many of you have worked on a product or application or website that uses three different types of modals? Yeah, OK. <laughs> I heard laughter, I didn't see many hands come up, but I, it's, it's such a reality. Tool tips, toggle tips. So when that happens, what, when that happens, when you have different types of what we call design patterns conveying the same type of interaction requirements to the user, it creates confusion, which means that inherently you're creating a bad user experience and even more than that, you're limiting the accessibility of your experience. Because if you weren't at the easily accessible talk, we, we talked a lot about cognitive accessibility and thinking about individuals with anxiety, individuals with, say, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, individuals with learning disabilities, maybe dyslexia, um, whether it's situational, perhaps they're drunk, 
there are all kinds of reasons why somebody might have difficulty understanding an application. How many times have you gone into something that you are responsible for yourself? You are the maintainer of this website or whatever it is and you couldn't quite figure out what you were supposed to click on in order to do whatever it is you needed to do. And this happens because over time those patterns become inconsistent. And so this is what we really want to prevent. And my own belief, and I've seen a number of other people kind of uh, espouse this opinion as well, is that this design system solution, this pattern solution that we're now seeing emerge is the way to actually counteract this problem, this consistent problem that we have. On a very simple level, one of the great things about a design system is that it becomes a living style guide. So here's one of the realities of a design system. It is a commitment. It takes work up front because what you're doing is you're abstracting the design from the application itself for a little bit and you're thinking about all of the little bits and pieces and you're making sure that all of those pieces are accounted for in your design system. And then once you've done that, now you have it. So that work doesn't have to be done again, but it does have to be maintained. Things might change. You might find out, for example, that your color contrast isn't meeting WCAG guidelines. And so you have to adjust your color scheme a little bit, which means that you need to go back to your designs. Well, if you have a design system, now you have a living style guide and you go back into that system, you make those changes and those changes percolate inherently throughout the remainder of the system. So it's not a huge amount of work to iterate when you have to, but you do have to put in the work up front in order to build it. This right here is a screenshot of, there's a great article that I hope, oh, I did link to it down here on the, on the slide itself. A great article from Airbnb about how they recently overhauled their entire design system for Airbnb um, and how incredibly successful that has been for them. It's definitely a worthwhile read. Um, this screenshot right here is simply uh, their kind of type their colors and their spacing that they extracted from their design system for the purposes of this article. So it, again, it's a living style guide. Anytime anything needs to change, then the designers will immediately go in and update this so that that information can percolate throughout the rest of the system and into the code. So as you update your style guide, as you make changes, everything comes up to date and remains consistent. The other thing about a design system is that your interaction states are defined in a design system. This is really, and I have a couple slides to, to reinforce this, but this is really where most design usability and accessibility fails. How many times have you realized on your own site that your links or buttons don't even have a hover state or a focus state. So I, I did actually see some hands come up and, and I applaud you for admitting that. Um, but this is, a, uh, this is so common and I do accessibility audits all the time and I see this all the time. I see this in sites that I've worked on after they get turned over to, to the development team or they even pass through QA with this with these pieces missing. And this is because it, it's so easy to forget them when you're working from the comp standpoint. You're working from kind of that, that screenshot, that moment in time. But we're not building pictures. We are building interactive, I don't know what we want to call them, interactive experiences that change and morph and react to whatever the user is doing at any given point in time, whatever their behaviors are, wherever they are, whatever type of device they're looking at this from, whatever type of device is going to be invented in three weeks that we haven't even thought of. This is what we're building. We're not building pictures. So to be working with pictures is really remiss from, uh, from our standpoint in terms of being able to actually do our job correctly. Uh, so let me just demonstrate a couple of these. So if we look at actually defining the hover, the focus, and the click states, 
we're going to go into Google's material design and take a look at the documentation in their design system for buttons. Um, so this, uh, this documentation is, you can see, very extensive, and it talks a lot about how the buttons work, which is fantastic from the standpoint of a, of a developer, really understanding what's happening here. Now, chances are pretty good most people in this room don't have the budget to create something like this. This comes out of Google. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. No, this is good. Did you say that this thing from Google, is this something you can use, or it's really just a demonstration kind of thing? Oh, no, you can use this. So you can actually build your own design patterns and all this, similar to the way you yeah. So, um, so Google re released Material I.O. Uh, with all of the specifications. There's code snippets that you can grab from here. Um, Google uh, um, calls it open source, and, and I haven't really dug into that aspect of it yet, but I, I do believe it probably is open source. Uh, there's a lot of great videos that have been released um, on how to use this. The, um, the other thing about this is that those people who are not coders, who don't want the code snippets, but are actually working on design in, say, something like Figma or Sketch or um, in XD, can actually download what are called sticker sheets. So those are basically symbol libraries that they can use to produce wireframes using all of these pieces. And there are also, uh, for Sketch at least, which is the one that I use, there's a little plug-in for Sketch, the material plugin that allows me to actually start, they have four base themes that, they, that, that they've started with, and allows you to choose one of those and then go in and start customizing it with your own colors and fonts and, and start making those changes with almost no effort at all. So um, I've actually convinced uh, the, an agency that I do a lot of work with, Stoffer, um, I've actually convinced them that for uh, projects that we get that don't have a design budget, that we make use of the material design as a starting point because it's so robust and, uh, and high quality. There are a couple of things that I'd like to improve um, in terms of accessibility. There's a few areas where the color contrast might be quite what, might, isn't quite what I would like it to be. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's unbelievable and they're continually improving it. So yeah, you can make use of this. And, and did you mention that you can get to the HTML that you Yeah, you can get to code snippets and everything. I and mean, the documentation is so incredible um, and, and thorough, and I definitely recommend you play with it. But what I really want to show you here is this piece right here. Um, so it actually is right here. You can take a look at the different buttons that they have within this particular theme. And it's hard to tell on the screen because, it's, uh, because of our contrast, but you'll see that the button kind of raises up a little. There's more, there's, uh, more than just a color indication that there's a difference. Um, and then if you click on it, it gives you a little bit of feedback there, so you get that as well. Um, and then if you are interested in one of the other buttons, you can do the same thing to kind of get a sense of what happens. So it's clearly defined and none of those states are missed. And this is the important piece. Because you st you're starting to think in a design system as opposed to thinking in terms of that kind of moment in time snapshot that is the comp, now you're remembering the states rather than that common error of forgetting to include them because they're not in the moment that you're trying to pass forward to get approval on. Another one that I want to demonstrate is when we start thinking about error and success messages. So this is another place that designers will often kind of forget to produce the appropriate designs or documentation because they're designing for the perfect moment. They're not designing for when there's a bunch of errors in the interaction, when something fails, or when a temporary message needs to come forward. Uh, so how do we make sure that those are included? Well, um, material design also has a, the snack bar approach for those messages. So you actually get to see what that looks like. And you're not going to forget any of those moments because, again, you're not thinking about the moment in time snapshot you're thinking about how does this interaction element actually behave and look instead. So it can give you a much more powerful uh, opportunity 
to remember to design what has to be designed for a successful system. So again, I said I was going to re-emphasize this, and I really think that this is, uh, there are so many ways in which design systems are valuable, but this really is one of the ones that's most dear to my heart. Uh, it's, it's such a common UX failure to not think about that interaction feedback. And this sort of, and this happens because designers aren't considering all the states, or they simply provide incomplete documentation to the development team. And uh, you know, developers are very diligent about doing what they're supposed to. So if they don't get that information, it might not be on their list of what they're supposed to do. And especially when you're in an agency setting, where you always have to remain within scope. So you're not going to do something that you're not told to do because otherwise you're, you're causing a problem when it comes to scope. So this, uh, this information needs to not be forgotten. There are so many reasons why it can be missed in the interface. Uh, so I think I've, I've probably made this point uh, well enough. So we can move on. Uh, but here's another example of how this can be documented, even if you're not thinking about the level of documentation that Google is providing, uh, because they have uh, more than enough people and to, to actually make this happen, um, and you might not. But this is a much simpler way to provide that information so that it can come across. The other nice thing about this is that you're thinking about all of the elements within your application that you're actually creating. So as Drupal developers, we're often creating views. We're just creating lists and lists and lists and lists. We're creating display types. We're creating blocks. We're creating custom blocks now. Um, we're creating all kinds of, we're creating paragraphs. We're creating different types of paragraphs. We're creating fields that, um, fields within content types that are actually entity reference fields to other content and displays within other content. So there's, there's a lot of going, going on here. And it's pretty much impossible to communicate all of that to a designer in a way that they can make sure that their picture-perfect comps actually address all of the possible scenarios. So this also gives you an opportunity to predefine all of those elements. And the really cool thing is, once they're all defined, you know, again, this is a lot of work up front, but once you do that work, now, a year from now, you decide, hey, you know, our school really wants to um, add a digital experience that, uh, that, that goes through the process that, uh, or goes through all of the ways in which we actually um, as a university benefited the moon landing. Well, now when you say that you want to do that, all of this work is already done. You don't have to go to a designer at all, really. You've already done that work. So instead, you just have to start making sure that you know the components that need to be there and check to make sure that your system actually uh, addresses all of those components. And then you can go ahead and start building. Another accessibility benefit that really does come out of design systems has to do with your users being able to rely on the expectations that you set within your application. So if your homepage, for example, uh, all of the links are blue, and then when you go to the next page, all of your links are green, you are actually changing an element that the user has already begun to learn about. And while the example that I just gave is pretty simple and most users would probably be okay, uh, you, you can get a sense for how that can lead to growing confusion throughout the application. So this gives you the opportunity to make sure that every time you have a Facebook icon uh, for a Facebook link on your system or every time you have a contact us icon, that those elements are consistent, that the user only has to learn them once and they don't have to continue relearning your interface as they engage with you. One of the complaints that I've heard about this frequently from designers, um, and I actually fell prey to this early on when I was first getting involved with a design library um, and a design system, uh, is that you, you see something, um, there's a requirement or a specification that comes back to you that nothing in the design system actually uh, accommodates. 
So the instinct for those of us who've been doing this for a very long time is, okay, I'll just create that piece in my little island. Well, that in, at that moment, you are starting to break down your design system. So if you commit to a design system, you really have to commit. And you have to remember to go back. So if your existing patterns don't actually solve whatever your new problems are, that means that either the new problem needs to be rethought, or more likely, because everything changes, our industry is changing faster than we can get sleep. So if it, since that's the case, we, what we actually need to do is recognize that our design system is also a living, breathing system. And instead of working on an island, what we need to do is we need to see what's missing from our design system in that new requirement and then go back to our design system and start to identify how we can make sure that our design system actually accommodates that new need. And that's a hard thing to do or to, to remember to do when we've been doing this for a long time and we're working on uh, sort of trying to retrain ourselves. But if we remember to think about it from the same context that we've now trained ourselves to think about our code, I think it will help us because it is exactly the same concept. In fact, I'm now using this tool called Abstract. How many of you know what Abstract is? No one. So Abstract is the best discovery for me recently ever. It is basically Git for design files. So if you can start to kind of take your, the mindset that we now have and how we've trained ourselves from code and, and apply that to design, the possibilities for just making this whole design experience and working with uh, the design team so much more effective when it comes to development, it is, it's huge. The thing that happens if you don't do this is that you start to incur design debt and design debt results in inconsistent interfaces and it increases your user's cognitive load when they try to understand your product. We already spoke to that a bit. But it is just like technical debt, it is the same thing. Design, design debt makes it really hard to maintain a project and it will increase the chance that you will miss something when you have to make changes to your product. I have a very good example from uh, a, um, a university, actually, that, that I did some work with. They needed one of, their, uh, one of their complaints was that their links were very hard to read because they were too small. This was a site that we inherited, and we didn't know how it was constructed. And so um, we gave the estimate, oh, you know, changing link size, that's got to be a consistent style throughout the, this Drupal site, right? So we gave them an estimate of two hours which seemed like a lot of cushion to say, okay, well, if something, you know, we're, we've just inherited this, this is brand new to us. If something goes horribly wrong here, two hours is more than enough time to cover that because we're literally just changing the size of links in a menu. I got in there and I changed the size of the links in the CSS and it did nothing except on the homepage. It did something on the homepage. Everywhere else, it did nothing. So, you know, look, look at the inspector, find out, okay, well, these links are being impacted by this. These links are being, about five hours later, I think I had touched the CSS for that uh, uh, hundreds of times. I, I don't even know, I stopped counting. Because it had been done, and, and it was using, it, it was all compiled, it was using SAS. It just, for some reason, it was all done in these really incremented manner, in this incremented manner, and it was all over the place. This is not uncommon. I'm giving you this example because it was an extreme and bizarre one, but this kind of thing happens all the time. And that is technical debt, but it is also design debt. And a design system would have prevented that. The other thing about this that I think the point has already been made, but I'm just going to reiterate it, is that having a design system like this where it becomes so much easier to percolate your changes forward 
is that it becomes a lot easier when you are in a situation where you have to remediate an accessibility concern, it becomes a lot easier to do so. Because at this point, you're touching your system and then it's, you're touching your design system and then it's percolating throughout your application or applications plural, as opposed to trying to, it, it, trying to remediate in all of these little islands. It makes it a lot easier and a lot faster and a lot less scary to do accessibility remediation work. The other cool thing about design systems is that they really do enhance communication and documentation. Another thing that we see all the time are those breakdowns between designer and developer. And since I've had the kind of rare opportunity to be both, I've seen those breakdowns from both sides. And it's really fascinating um, and, and, and curious why it happens because we have the same goal. But somehow, design teams and engineers think about documentation and understand documentation in a slightly different way. Well, this, this work that has been done to date on design systems and what's out there for us to use as examples, um, as well as tools such as Abstract, and there's another great tool, Zeppelin, which can be used for, uh, for wireframes and such to be sent over to developers with annotations and actually gives you code snippets right from there as well. Um, these tools make it a lot easier for designers to communicate to the engineering team in the exact same language and for the engineers to ask those questions back in the right space where the designer will completely understand what they're asking about and be able to see what's missing. So design systems themselves and why this is work up front they are design documentation. They're not just a system, but they are the documentation. And there's a couple of great examples. We've looked at Material I.O., so I won't go back to that, but one that you've probably heard a fair amount about, even in, this, in the context of Drupal Camp, and most certainly if you went to DrupalCon, would be Pattern Lab. Um, and there's, there's actually Pattern Lab, you know, Drupal can actually be built. There's a Pattern Lab for Drupal 8, basically, and, and you can use this concept in Drupal 8 as a way of uh, kind of holding on to um, and creating your design system. And so it's fantastic. Pattern Lab, if you've never seen it before, is fantastic documentation that just goes through absolutely everything. You can get the code out of here. And you can start to really look at the components from a very kind of from different levels and see how things actually work together. Uh, let's look at forms. Um, you can go down to even more. Um, oh, there's nothing there. Let's go to feedback. Feedback's a good one. So you can start looking at your feedback, you can grab your code, and it makes it a lot easier for you to get all of that information in one place. Oops. But one of the important things to keep in mind is that um, things like material design and pattern lab were not created for Drupal. Material design was created for Android, and it was created for what Google actually does. So that is what it's optimized for. That's what those entities are based on. Pattern Lab, I'm not entire, I actually don't know what the kind of conceptualization was behind exactly how those pieces are broken up. But if you do take some time and look through the Pattern Lab documentation, you will see that it doesn't quite match Drupal. So that's one of the important things to really think about when you are working on a design system for any site, whether it's Drupal or WordPress or Magento, if you're building with React, think about the components of whatever it is that you're building with and create your design system with those components in mind, not based on you know, pattern lab out of the box or material design out of the box because then you'll, you might fall back into that trap of forgetting something because you're not including something that's inherent to Drupal. There's a great article 
Uh, I don't want to say her name incorrectly because I, I did last time I pronounced it. I think it's Zakia. Um, it was a few years ago that she corrected me. Uh, she is really sharp uh, and uh, she's spoken here a few times, very inspirational um, in terms of her knowledge of development and she's now kind of the pattern lab person at chapter three. She has a fantastic article about really kind of where you can get yourself into trouble if you're using Pattern Lab and how to think about working with Drupal and Pattern Lab together to really keep yourself on track. So I highly recommend you make use of, of her article and even reach out to her. She's an active community member um, and very present. So what, I, what I'd like to do now is come out of the slide deck in just a moment, and we're actually going to look at Claro, a theme that's being designed right now for Drupal 9. Um, and we're gonna take a look at it in Figma. Figma is a, a design a user experience design tool. So we're gonna look at the actual document itself. Before I do that, are there any questions about anything that we've already covered? Right. Drupal and that you should kind of be careful or whatever. And that, that went by me really quickly. I was just wondering, could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Like, like yeah. in other words, what would be the right way to do it? Right. Well, using the knowledge that you gain from Pattern Lab would definitely be a great idea. Using the knowledge that you gain from Material would be a great idea. And you can start with either of those as a base. But what you're really going to need to do is look at your requirements, your specifications, and the information architecture that you're constructing for your Drupal system, and make sure that you adjust the design library, the design system that you are creating for your application to match the information architecture of your system. And so Drupal and you know, React, the sort of way of thinking about information architecture in those two spaces is different. You're going to use different language. Inherently, natively, things sort of fall in different ways. The way even as simple as checkboxes. If you're, if you're designing for iOS versus Android, the way that checkboxes behave is inherently different if you're using the native languages that, that you're going to work with. So keeping in mind that your, not only Drupal as a whole has its own language and its own way of kind of placing those elements, but your application, your website, your mobile app, your watch app, whatever it is you're doing, is also going to have its own unique information architecture. You have, I, I know this for a fact, that you have all kinds of different paragraph entity types, right? So each of those paragraph entity types will not be represented in the molecules of Pattern Lab out of the box. But they do need to be represented in your design system. Oh, so you can theoretically make those adjustments. Exactly. It's a, yeah, it's a starting point, but you will have to do the work to make sure that your design system and your information architecture are cohesive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, the, the blog post that I linked to is that, just read it. <laughs> I can't, I cannot give you a better presentation than that blog post on how to really make that happen. Cool. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we move on? No? Okay, everybody's just excited to see this, huh? Um, so, technically, I am supposed to be involved in this, but I've been way too busy and haven't left any information since April. Um, but there are a lot of people, a lot of community contributors, of which you could certainly be one if you'd like, who are working together to create a, a better design system for Drupal 9. And this is Claro. This is a, um, an admin theme. And it's really, uh, it's really neat to see what, what I'm showing you here. These are kind of final pages. Um, okay. So these are sort of final comps or, or pages, if you will. But all of this 
is being rendered dynamically based on the components, because this is where the real work is happening. So if we take a look in here, um, what do I want to show you? What's going to drive the point home most successfully here? Let's go. Oh, this is a good one. So here we're looking at all of the components for behaviors for text and how that plays out. And so you'll see how the different moments in time actually look. You can't do this really on a comp. And these, are, these components, these elements, are created as what we call symbols. So it's just like with code snippets. So if, um, if I come in and I say, you know what, um, which I, I will when I have time, I'm a little bit concerned about the contrast, the color contrast on this right here. I'm concerned that it might not pass contrast checks and we might want to look at it. If I go in and I say that, then we don't have to, the, you know, the, the individuals who are actually working really hard in here, and unlike me, don't have to go in and edit every single time that particular item is displayed. They can simply go in and work on this or work on the original symbol here, update it, and then that will percolate throughout the system and the code itself, the great thing is that the code itself is going to be able to be extracted from here as well. So that CSS snippet becomes something that can also be reused and become part of the overall code. Um, we're also looking at you know, different states here and those behaviors, that kind of interaction. Um, this is actually probably a question for me, so at some point I'll go in and take a look. <laughs> so you, you can kind of see how this is working, and it's pretty neat to, to see this play out. And some of the uh, improvements that this has really led to are really looking at something as simple as the publish status and save, preview, and delete. I want you to raise your hand if you have never experienced one of your content managers having difficulty with this section of the form. So there's, OK, I saw a couple of hands raised, but do you even work with content managers? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, the problem is, is I don't sit with them, so I don't right, right. they're going to go out of their way to show me. Yeah. God, I really, why did they develop that that way? Yeah. non-intuitive. So, so this is, if, I don't know if, you're, if you are calling to mind how Drupal uh, kind of looks today. This is a massive improvement just from an understanding standpoint. Um, it's actually gotten even better. What you're seeing here, the word delete is just a word, but now there's actually a little trash box icon next to it. So it's getting better as we go. Um, I can actually show you that. So the, the clarity of this is just continuing to increase over time. And all of this percolates into the overall theme as well as other iterations of this kind of uh, experience so that it can be reused over and over again uh, without difficulty. Uh, so it can be a pretty great um, tool. So I'm certainly more than happy to show you more of this if you're curious or uh, you know, help you figure out how to be involved if you're also curious and interested. There's a lot of work going on in here and it's pretty cool. So Rand, is this what you're we're looking at of the live it is. sandbox that, you're, that you work in? It is, yeah. Or it's it's the, the actual Figma project. It, what's it called? The Figma. It's Figma. The, the work is being done in Figma. So if someone else were working in here, I would actually see their cursor and their name where they're working, which is also great. Figma can do, there's a, a number of tools that can allow for that kind of interaction. And uh, yeah, it's very useful. Is Figma a Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> there are ways to do it for free, um, but yes. All right. Are there any of those ways of doing it for free or legal? Yes. No, 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 no. Sorry, that, that, was a, that was a funny way for me to word it. 
Um, when I said that there are ways of doing it for free, um, so when I was invited as a contributor on the Figma project for the, uh, that Drupal theme, um, I didn't have to pay for my account. But if I were going to create my own projects and then start sharing those with people, I would have to pay for that account. So you can be involved for free, but if you want to do your own stuff, then, you, then it's not free. It looks like you can, it's free for two editors and three projects. That, that makes sense. Great, thank you for looking that up. So for the recording, um, it's free for two editors and up to three projects. Uh, so we already kind of talked about faster prototyping and why this can lead to faster prototyping. But once you have the design system in place, now somebody comes to you and says, okay, we need this new feature, we need this new thing, we need this new section of our website. And historically, especially in the agency setting, it's like, okay, well now we go through the wireframes, we get those wireframes approved, blah, 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 blah. Well, in this case, it's, okay, well, here's all of our components. Let's plug, 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 built, take a look. So it's much faster, much, much easier to get to that stage. Um, what this really means from my point of interest is that you can get to testing with real users much faster, which means even if you're not releasing it yet, you're just seeing if it works or making sure that there are no usability or accessibility issues you can get it out there very cheaply and get it in front of somebody in its actual state and make sure that it's working and nothing needs to be changed. And that is really cool because also having come from an agency background, I know for a fact that it's very hard to convince clients that their hard earned money or very limited budgets need to be spent on user testing. And this way, it doesn't need to cost a lot of money. It can be a lot less expensive, and so it's a lot easier to make it happen. So there's a few resources that I tried to pull together to help you if you're interested in setting this up or getting started. Um, obviously, the links to Material I.O. and Pattern Lab, very important. And then uh, the rest of these are mostly articles. The, um, the last two, the easy, easily accessible slide deck, that's from the presentation yesterday, so there's a lot of accessibility considerations that I hope you will take into anything that you do moving forward. Um, so that's there as a resource just to be thinking about when you're putting this together. Um, and then the color palette builder is also just a great tool anytime you're dealing with colors to make sure that those colors are accessible. Everything in between is an article that's definitely worth reading. I don't think I included Zakia's article, but it, it is linked uh, up earlier in the slide deck. So definitely, absolutely worth reading. Questions, comments, concerns? Tommy. Do you have any um, go-to tools like within the Drupal ecosystem? Like I, I've looked at uh, the style guide module before to try to show you like, these are all the components that you're gonna have to touch. Yeah. Right. That hasn't been updated in a while. I don't know how well it is with Drupal 8 or going forward. Um, but other things like that that can help you when you don't have a big budget or a team mm -hmm. working on a project like this, just to get something where you can start doing thinking about the components rather than pages as a whole. Yeah. Um, do I have a good resource for that? No. I'm still kind of trying to find one that I like because everything that I work on is unique in its own way. So that sort of starting point, uh, always, I always sort of feel like I have to start again. Um, I have been making use of material as a sort of design foundation. Um, and then the fact that I'm a contributor on the, Car on the Claro theme um, in there means that I can kind of peek in there and, and use that um, as well. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing, if anybody uh, at any point would like to ask me for it, is I'm working on my own sketch library for uh, Drupal admin, out of the box Drupal components. Um, it's, you know, it really only has in it what I've needed so far. <laughs> but if you are using sketch and you would like my sketch library, once I have enough in there to consider it worth contributing, I will be contributing it. But right now it's just a little too um, spare and uh, I, I don't know that, unless you ask for it specifically, that you'd be anything but annoyed if I put it up right now. 
<laughs> it's mostly the form, the form pieces because that's what I've been doing a lot of work with. But I'm more than happy to share that. And then I will be contributing it once I have more in it. Give me a year to. <laughs> Um, any any other questions? Yeah. A question. It's not directly related to anything you presented because it that was really well articulated and was really great. Um, but when it comes to and I I couldn't make it to your other presentation because I would have it at the same time, but is are there any any one particular site that that has a tool to sort of scan your site for accessibility issues that you like more than others? Because I tried a few, <laughs> yeah. and it all returns so much gobbledygook. It said, I, it's like, I've taken me a month of Sundays to figure this out. So that's a very good question, and since not everybody was in this room, was in the talk. First of all, download the, the, the videos up from the talk. It's already on the session note on, on the Drupal campsite, and the slide deck is linked there. Um, so definitely pull that down because there are actually a few slides that in very big, bold letters say 30%. 30% is the amount of uh, accessibility issues that you can find through any kind of an automated tool. So the real answer to your question is no. There isn't. However, <laughs> however, I know you would like some help with, with that. Um, there are a couple that I do like. I really like Site Improve, which uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, extremely expensive, but they do have a free Chrome extension that you can use for a good portion of their um, of their testing. Actually, it's uh, pretty pretty good. Um, I really love my my absolute favorite is Axe from DQ. I'm sorry, what was that? A X E, -E. and it comes from DQ D E Q U E. DQ Systems, which is an, a fantastic organization. If you're looking for you know, an organization to help you really learn about accessibility, they are top notch. Um, so that's a, their, their tool is great. Um, they are also working on a beta right now for a guided tool that might actually get you more than 30% because it actually asks you questions as you go through the interface. Um, that beta is not released yet. Uh, but I do have it, so if you're interested in taking a look at it, um, Martin, you might actually be interested in taking a look uh, at what it can do as well. Um, then I'm more than happy to show you. I'll, you know, I'll be here through lunch, and, and then I'm going to go back to my kids. But um, I will be here through lunch, so if you're interested in seeing that, um, and also if you're interested in seeing how a screen reader actually works and how you can test with a screen reader yourself, more than happy to demonstrate that. In fact, maybe next year I'll do a session just on how to use a screen reader. Um, I should have thought of that. That would have been fun, really fun. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that's an answer to your question. No, um, the, really easily, the easily accessible deck has a lot of links to a lot of my favorite resources to really help you get going, as well as a, a number of Chrome extensions that will test different things like the no coffee filter um, and Open Dyslexic, which are fantastic tools for accessibility testing. Yeah, up there. Do you use the site improve module? I don't. I didn't. Does Drupal has a site improve module? Yeah. Well, there you go. I have not used the site improve yeah. module. I would be interested in checking it out. Thank you for letting me know. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, you I have to be a, a, a sub user. site improve user. Yeah, and Stoffer is now a site improve. Um, partner or whatever, so. Um, I that to my dozen <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may, maybe, maybe. You know, I, I, again, Site Improve is great. They're, they're very expensive. They're, they're a fantastic tool, and I, I could certainly happily tell you to, to buy it and know that you'll get your money's worth. Um, but at the same time, it's so hard for me to say, um, add that to a top modules list or whatever, because again, you're looking at 30%. So much of accessibility is about understanding, and a machine can't tell you whether or not the content of the image is properly conveyed in your alt text. Uh, you know, a machine can't tell you if the wording in your header is actually going to make sense to the people using your site. And a lot of that is what accessibility is about. Yeah? That's a great point. Responsibility is going to follow the users through training.
mean? So in other words, well, yes and no. Uh, definitely download the use, easily accessible deck. There's a lot of accessibility that's done on the design side, a lot that's done on the development side, a lot that's done on the product upkeep side and the content management side. Um, there are ways to help your content managers do a better job. Right. So, yeah. of the simplest example, it's mandatory that you're required to put in an off tag on mm -hmm. the image, right? So yeah. that's our way of forcing it, but that, there's nothing to stop us from putting in a picture of a dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and yep. when it's not a picture of a dog, it's actually a picture of a blind person with a dog going up an accessibility ramp. That sort of thing is a training issue, but with mm -hmm. that third, I guess the question that I would ask is, if you get 30% back from a tool, is it the 30% that is the most useful part to keep you from getting a lawsuit? Because well, yes, at the because end of the day, we want to have a really accessible site because we want to really think about right. the user, but we also don't want to get sued. Okay, so so th that's a yes and no answer to that. Um, so lawsuits have increased dramatically over the last couple of years, and right now it's such an exponential increase that the number of lawsuits by the end of this year we we can't even really predict it. Um, with, there have already been more this year than in all of last year. Um, so, or actually, when I got that statistic, I think it was in March. So by March, there had been more than all of the previous year. Um, and it's not March anymore, and I keep forgetting that. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truth. Um, but the, um, there are two types of lawsuits out there. The most common lawsuits are the legal firms that are now using these automated tools to just kind of scan for sites that they can go after. Um, a lot of people think of those firms in a very negative light because they're thinking about it as kind of being a trolling or, or a kind of shady business. I actually, as an accessibility professional, I'm grateful for it because it's causing people to actually start to act. <laughs> and whatever it is that gets them to act, I don't care if it's shady business, um, I guess. But, um, but the other type of lawsuit that it won't protect you from are the real ones, right. the ones that actually come from users. Um, and those ones are going to be a lot harder to remediate and a lot harder to fight if you're not thinking about it up front. Yeah. So there's a yes and no answer to that question. Well, that's an excellent <laughs> Yeah. If we are thinking about it, right. I, from the get-go, I mean, that yeah. it, it was, accessibility was, was absolutely a requirement from the, from mm -hmm. the Wireframe yeah. from the word go on our site that we built. Well, and universities are exceptionally susceptible to these lawsuits. And I work with a lot of universities, and I know about significant accessibility issues on a lot of the sites that I know about. And, it, and that's not even itself going to get you sued. If you have a plan, if you know about it, if you have it documented and you have a plan, and you can prove that you have a plan, that's what's going to help you in a lawsuit, more than trying to get the automated tests to pass. And this is the other thing to keep in mind. You will never get to pass your automated tests at 100%. Because again, accessibility is somewhat subjective. And sometimes you will be doing something that is an accessibility remediation or, or something that you've done specifically for accessibility that will trigger some kind of an error because the machine isn't really recognizing it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Does material design and pattern lab, do they have uh, accessibility baked into the code? So that those snippets have RA tags and things like that in them? I don't know the answer to that with Pattern Lab. Uh, material design does have some of that in there. But the design was very much uh, thought of with there's auto color contrast checkers in there. So if you're using some of their plugins to kind of create things, it'll actually warn you about some of the issues that you might encounter. Um, but a lot of the code that's being moved out of the uh, out of Pattern Lab or, or out of uh, Material Design, a lot of that is in the CSS landscape which isn't where ARIA is going to live. Yeah. Other questions? All right, well, those are all fantastic questions. Thank you for spending this time with me. And uh, again, I'll, I'll be sitting in there at lunchtime, so if you want to look at any of the things that we spoke about or, or peeked into, um, happy to go over them with you.